on Health Matters Television for Life. Can this really happen? You bet it can. A Spokane man with a family history of heart problems. I was feeling fine, no change noticed, just going on my daily life. Gets this diagnosis. Quadruple bypass. His story of hope and a lesson for everyone as we discuss heart health and answer your questions. Right now on Health Matters. Health Matters is made possible by our viewers, the friends of KSBS, and by Providence Healthcare. Providence's motto is know me, care for me, ease my way. And Providence does that. I've seen it over and over again. I'm Dr. Stephen Murray and I chose Providence because I believe in their mission statement. And working together with others of like mind is a very powerful way to take care of patients. My name is Beth Perez and I am a registered nurse and I work at Holy Family Hospital on the labor and delivery unit. I'm about to have my second child and I chose Providence because I love and trust the people that I work with and why wouldn't I seek care from people that I love and trust. Good evening, I'm your host, Teresa Lukens. Thanks so much for tuning in this evening. We know that Americans suffer one and a half million heart attacks and strokes each year. So tonight, our focus is on heart health. Here to share their expertise is our panel for this broadcast. Dr. Sean Spangler is with Providence Spokane Cardiology. His areas of interest include preventative cardiology, treating patients who have heart valve problems, heart failure, coronary artery or heart disease or heart rhythm problems. Jenny Johnson is a registered nurse. She is board certified, a lifestyle consultant and co-founder of Living for a Healthy Heart. She is also the author of the book, Wake Up Call 911, It's Time to Reduce Your Risk for a Heart Attack and Stroke. Dr. Matthew Forrester is with Providence Northwest Heart and Lung Surgical Associates. His areas of expertise include aortic aneurysm surgery, aortic valve replacement and repair, minimally invasive cardiac surgery and coronary artery disease. And finally, Dr. Matt Taylor is with Heart Clinics Northwest. His specialty is cardiovascular disease and electrophysiology. And I wanna thank all of you for being here tonight. It's an important topic, and of course it is Heart Month, so it's a very timely topic as well. We encourage your phone calls this evening. Ask our panel any number of questions you'd like about heart disease. Uh, we also encourage your emails if you prefer. So we'll start taking those as soon as they come in. And Dr. Forrester, I wanna start with you. We're talking about an extremely broad topic of heart disease and, and coronary disease. Narrow the focus a bit for us and let's talk about um, some of the conditions that might affect most of our viewers tonight. Sure, as you mentioned, heart disease actually refers to a, a very broad uh, number of diseases. Um, most people that we see in the office have, have heart disease that I would categorize in a few different uh, categories. One would be valve disease, aortic valve, mitral valve, there's a few other valves, but uh, that encompasses a lot of the disease we, we see. Um, coronary artery disease, uh, which is commonly associated with heart attacks uh, for people and uh, essentially obstructions of the arteries that supply the heart muscle itself. is is a big topic that I think encompasses a lot of what people think of as, as heart disease when we see that. And then we have other things like aneurysms, aortic aneurysms and other arteries in the body. And certainly there is an electrical system in the heart um, and we can have diseases of the electrical system and we can go on and on. But I, I think those three or four categories really encompass most of the things that people think of with heart disease. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Taylor, we know there are some things we can control and other things we cannot control. Talk about some of those. You bet. Uh, it's, there's, you can't control your age and you can't control your genes. And besides that, everything's in, the, in, in game. It's in uh, fair game. Uh, I tell people the, the biggest thing we can control is a lifestyle of activity and a decent diet. Uh, basically in America, we're trained to avoid that diet and eat stuff that's easy and quick. And anything that's easy and quick is probably <laughs> Should, should be avoided. So your lifestyle activity, 30 minutes a day of exercise is worth, it goes a long way. You don't need to be doing triathlons, but just to, to get started. And as you start an act, active lifestyle, you get a lot of benefit just from going from nothing to a little bit. That's worth a lot. So your lifestyle with exercise, diet, and uh, making good choices with some of the stuff that you decide to get in, in forms of food and uh, processed stuff is uh, 
is filled with things you don't want in there. So you try to avoid that and go natural with lots of good stuff instead. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dr. Spangler, when we do start to have a problem, what kind of warning signs will we generally see? And I know, again, we're talking about a broad topic here, but what are some of those warning signs? Yeah, sure. I mean, it, it, it depends on what disease in terms of Matt was, uh, Dr. Forster was talking about a couple of different uh, diseases, were, but specifically, I think heart disease, coronary artery disease, leading to heart attack and stroke, I think is what most people are worried about. Um, early signs certainly can be an ache or a pressure or tightness in your chest. It's not necessarily pain. Um, it can be those types of symptoms that people may feel. Again, sometimes it does go down to the left arm, um, but oftentimes that's not necessarily the heart, but that can be a sign. Um, you can start to feel shorter breath with things you're doing. Uh, you may have an intolerance for the activities that you normally do. Um, if you could uh, normally walk up a flight or two of stairs, you may not be able to do that now, and that could be a sign that you're developing heart disease. Um, feeling dizzy or lightheaded or potentially blacking out or passing out are also signs. Um, feeling irregular heartbeats or, or palpitations, uh, sometimes uh, swelling in the legs. Um, so there's, there's a lot of signs that potentially can be a, an, an early warning that, you're, you, that you have heart disease or heart failure or something on those lines. If you have, some people will have a number of those indicators. Mm -hmm. Others may have one or two or something. So at what point do you often see a patient when it's too late or will they recognize those signs? Uh, it depends. Uh, you know, unfortunately, I think some people uh, we do see too late because uh, they, they do come into the emergency room and they are having a heart attack. Uh, and they may have had some warning sign a week or two before that they were having a little bit of an ache or pressure in their chest. So uh, certainly um, if you have some risk factors, and, and even some people they don't have risk factors, uh, you should probably pay very close attention to those types of, to those types of symptoms. Um, and, and get checked out and potentially then we could find that you do have coronary artery disease or heart disease and, and be able to you know, impact upon that with medicines or lifestyle changes or stents or something along those lines. So, so yes, um, any of those particular signs or symptoms uh, can be a warning and you may want to get seen by, by one of us or your primary care physician and, and have it checked out to see if there's more testing that may be warranted. Mm -hmm. And Jenny, your area of expertise is in prevention. Um, and in going through your book, uh, I noticed that your own father had a massive heart attack at the age of 46. Is that where your passion toward helping people prevent heart disease started? Probably. I loved him dearly, and he had every risk factor known to man now. You know, that was back in the 70s. And, you know, if 80% of all heart attacks could be prevented, and this is a statistic that was reported in the American Heart Association statistical update, if people quit smoking, ate a healthier diet, increased their physical activity, managed their weight, and controlled their cholesterol, their blood pressure, and their blood sugar. 80% could be prevented. But changing behavior is easier said than done. And um, I went back and studied and got my PhD to learn what are those things that work when people are able to change those behaviors. And I hoped in the book to really address some of those things in small, small, simple steps. If people can't exercise for 30 minutes a day, maybe they can take a five minute walk away from their house and back. Maybe they can add an apple to their diet. There's a lot of simple things people can do that make huge benefits in their health. And there's some new screening tools to find out someone like my father who's at risk. And I write, I write about that on my, on my website, but they're still underutilized. And even though the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology recognize, recognize, recommend some of these tests, few people are getting them. And you can get them in Spokane and Coeur d'Alene, and I'm talking about the non-contrast coronary artery calcium score, which measures the disease that's building up. And then it can tell the cardiologist or the doctor, I need to worry about this person. Mm -hmm. But So I'm trying to get the word out to take advantage of those tests. Uh, what have you found works? How do you reach people? Well, the, medicine does a great job diagnosis and treating heart disease, but psychologists have taught us a lot about that motivation piece. People move through ch stages as they're trying to change a behavior from denial where they don't know that they've got a problem, they're not connecting their harmful behavior to that health outcome that we're mm -hmm. seeing that's harming them, to I'm weighing the pros and the cons, I know I need to change, I know I need to increase my exercise or eat better, but the barriers are too great to, um, I'm taking baby steps, but I'm not committed to it, to actually doing it, which is the action stage, and finally, they've been at it for six months and it's become part of their life. 
most of our medical advice is directed at that 20% who get it and are doing it. What do we do with all the 80%? And our mistake is we give them lifestyle prescriptions that are just too hard for them to do. So smaller, simple steps that people can feel good about and actually do that are part of their life, the research is showing is more effective. And that's how we get them moving and get them start, starting to take better care of themselves. Mm -hmm. Do you find, Dr. Forrester, that it takes a major event before people will start to make changes? Unfortunately, I think it does. I, we, we see often patients that come to us in the office with a family member that, that has, you know, essentially a, a near-death experience. I mean, these people can often be very, very sick, and, and they need surgery, and, and that's a big deal. And, and people realize that, that they need to change some things and quit smoking and, and live healthier and exercise. And, it's a challenge. People know these things. These are not things that have just have been discovered yesterday or last week or late even last year. We know how to be healthy, but it, it's often hard to make ourselves do that. We also know, though, that Dr. Taylor, that there's a gender gap. We're finally learning the difference between men and women and the indicators. And we talked about some of the basic warning signs. But that gender gap, there does it does make a difference between men and women and indicators. Yes. Yeah. Th I my understanding, and Sean would have expertise more here, but it's you have much higher uh, risk of having atypical symptoms, or females ha are more likely to have symptoms that don't make you think of heart disease. Um, uh, it's particularly, we tell people about chest pain that's crushing and runs down the left arm, and in females, you're more likely to have symptoms that might get brushed off. Females can all, it's similar to diabetics, where you can have heart attacks and perhaps not feel any pain at all. And the, this, uh, the red dress is appropriate as we address women's health as well. And there is lots of research being put into that and how the gaps can be closed. And, um, but it's, it, it is, it's, it, there are gaps that are significant from men and women in terms of the symptoms they can feel with coronary disease in particular. Mm -hmm. it, it still surprises people to find out that heart disease kills more women in this country than any other uh, disease. Mm -hmm. I, that's still a surprise to people because we tend to think breast cancer, other, you know, diseases that are taking women, but it's heart disease. Yeah, yeah heart disease is the number one, I think, killer of women uh, within the United States. Um, it's not a surprise to us per se, but yes, it is a surprise to a lot of non-medical folks. Um, breast cancer gets a lot of attention and, and, you know, I think we need to pay more attention to heart disease. I mean, Certainly, I think women may present at a later age uh, than men in respect to, this, to developing heart disease. But unfortunately, they tend to catch up as they get into their 60s, and, and really the incidence of heart disease becomes fairly equal to men. And so uh, I would say that uh, most women are at an equal risk of developing this, you know, largely over their lifetime. And they need to pay attention to risk factors and, and modify those to hopefully prevent heart disease because they are at risk. I wanted to add a statistic to that. <clears throat> when I go up and speak to groups of women, one in about 32 women will die from breast cancer. One in three will die from heart disease. But we worry about our mammograms when they're abnormal. We don't worry about our cholesterol and our blood pressure. We minimize that, and those are huge risk factors for our life. For men, prostate cancer is about one in 35 men will die from prostate cancer. One in three will die from heart disease. Mm. So in my Go Red for Women luncheon, I'm trying to turn up the volume that we need to be taking our heart attack risk more seriously. And our symptoms are, can be shortness of breath, fatigue. What woman busy with running around and doing all the crazy things we do doesn't get tired? And that's how we present to the ER. And our disease is different, which one of you guys could probably speak to that better. We don't have that crushing elephants on my chest pain like our men get. So when we go to the ER, it's easily missed because it's so mild. So. We know that one of the, the signs of, of a heart attack is that extreme pain, the crushing pain in the chest. But for a lot of people, it's, it's simply the, um, the family history. And we want to introduce you to one Spokane man who actually uh, understood his family history. He recognized it. And it's probably what ended up uh, saving his life. Tom Granger has plenty to celebrate. At age 63, he's thinking about retirement and spending more time with his grandkids. Family is important to him for many reasons, especially when it comes to his health. My dad died of a heart attack when he was 64. Mom went through two triple bypasses in her lifetime, managed to live until 97. About eight years ago, Tom started seeing a cardiologist. 
The checkups were his way of being proactive. After that first visit, we just rescheduled every two years. When he saw the doctor in June, he was feeling fine. I was feeling perfectly normal. I'm active, I mountain bike in the summertime, ski yard in the winter. Tom had no symptoms, but two days of testing turned up serious heart problems. Finding out that there's five major blockages, one at 100% and four at 90%, and we need to cut the chest open and take care of it. A few days later, Tom was in surgery and undergoing a quadruple bypass. The prognosis at that point was could keel over tomorrow or within a week or within a month. With the major blockages I had, my life was a ticking time bomb. The surgery was successful, and 10 weeks later, Tom returned to work. There were ups and downs during his recovery, but Tom came through feeling pretty much the same as before. I thought that after the surgery, especially with the five blockages, that I should feel like a 20-year-old, but that didn't seem to happen. Tom is back to the things he loves, like skiing and mountain biking, and whenever he can, sharing this message with others. Can this really happen? You bet it can. So, what do you do about it? You become proactive. You get your family doctor, uh, you get the referral to the cardiologist, whatever it takes. So, Dr. Forrester, you were one of uh, Tom's doctors, and sure. so his being proactive really did save his life, but is that a rare case when someone takes that sort of action? Well, Tom's story is, is unique. He didn't really have chest pain or angina or anything classic, really. He just had a family history that he knew about, and he was a responsible individual. He actually took care of himself, and he was active, and even with the activity at a high level, he wasn't having symptoms. There are some tests that, that the cardiologist can do that, that can prove that that, or that you have a suspicion for these, these blockages and, and also prove that the muscle itself isn't getting enough blood supply and that leads down to a road that ultimately, like Tom, ends up in my office. But um, I don't see that many people who don't have any idea that they have a problem. Um, so it's a little bit unnerving that someone like Tom, as responsible to us, can, can get there and get that. Because there are people that don't know and don't do anything about it until it's a problem. Tom would be back and already is to a normal life, and I'm not surprised that he doesn't feel any different because he didn't feel poorly in the first place. What would you suggest people do then as far as starting that process of learning a family history and then taking proactive action? Well, so I think everybody in general, if, even if you had a, just a wonderful family history where your parents lived till 90s and they never had any heart history, I think you should still be proactive about your heart healthiness. and. And, and eat a heart healthy diet and try to be very active and try to be the healthiest person you can be. Um, but in his case, I think it is interesting uh, in the respect that if he didn't have a lot of traditional risk factors, you know, in terms of having high blood pressure or cholesterol or diabetes, um, he just had a genetic predisposition to have heart disease. And, and you know, you, for those patients, we, we, we have this kind of low suspicion that they may have a heart problem because we think they're living very healthy. But unfortunately, they still have this, this ability to develop heart disease just because they inherit it. And so going back to what Jeannie had said earlier, I actually think one of a helpful test in this particular case where they don't have a lot of risk factors except for family history is that, is that coronary calcium score. Um, because family history is not included in our traditional, we, we have these calculators to say, what is your heart risk? And it doesn't include family history. And I found that to be a very helpful test to say, you know, for a, say a, a 50, year, 50 year old male whose dad had a heart attack at, at, at 49, uh, who doesn't smoke or doesn't have high cholesterol, we get that and we find they have a lot of coronary, you know, they have a lot of calcium in their heart arteries already. And that can be a very good clue to say, uh-oh, you already have developed heart disease, you know, even though you're doing the best you can. And so that, that's a tool I will sometimes use in these folks um, is to help kind of tease this out. Unfortunately, though, we can't prevent all heart disease and sometimes people just, they do the best they can, they have no symptoms and this still happens. But that, that would be one, one thing that I would, have people think about or ask their doctor about is, you know, how, you know, should I screen for this if I have a very strong family history? Mm -hmm. And that can be actually be even more helpful than a stress test. Sometimes is that a, a fairly simple test? It is a simple test, yeah. It's just a simple scan of the chest. Uh, you don't need contrast. You don't need an IV. Uh, it takes just a few seconds and, and you can get a score there. And so it can kind of tell you whether you're low or high risk. 
And, and people who have symptoms, you know, a stress test is the most uh, you know, appropriate test. But in asymptomatic people, this is a good test. Okay. We have our first phone call this evening. Patricia here in Spokane. Good evening, Patricia. Thanks for waiting. Hi. Thank you for taking my call. Uh, a little background. Um, I was a previous smoker. A couple of years ago, I did have a head and neck cancer that I was treated from and got a lot of radiation from my upper chest through my throat area. Just this last uh, April, I got dizzy and fainted, uh, went to see a cardiologist, did the angioplasty, and they found a blockage of about 75% of the carotid artery that goes into your brain. And everything was going fine. I thought I was fine. And then this last January, I had fainted a couple more times in my kitchen, um, got back to the cardiologist and found out that the stent had failed. So they went in and I believe he replaced it. My question is, should I ask for a stress test and get a complete evaluation? Um, should I be worried about bypass surgery at this point? Where do you go? Where should I go now? Um, I do have a healthy diet and um, I'm not really exercising a whole lot right now because I really hurt my foot when I uh, fainted. Um, but I'll um, go ahead and wait for your answer and your advice. Thank All you. Right. Thank you, Patricia. Who would like to answer Patricia's question? You want to take this, Sean? Oh, I mean, a, a couple of thoughts on this. Um, uh, one is that uh, it sounds like she's, she, she has vascular disease involving the carotid artery goes to the brain. And uh, anytime you have disease involving any blood vessel, whether it be to your brain, to your legs, unfortunately, you can also develop the same kind of disease within the, the blood vessels to your heart. So right there, that makes me somewhat concerned. Uh, you know, un radiation therapy, unfortunately, does increase your risk of developing vascular disease, and so that may have put you at risk, the previous radiation that you had. And certainly, if the radiation went into the chest, that would make me more concerned. So in that respect, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned and say, well, you may have coronary artery disease or heart disease, and you maybe want to be screened for that. If you have no symptoms at all, then it's not that imperative you have to get a stress test. I would just really want you to be on good medicines to treat the disease that they've already found in the carotid arteries. If we do that, uh, you know, you're going to give yourself the best chance to prevent a heart attack and prevent a stroke as long as we're doing everything we can. And again, try to work, you know, on being more active, even though it's, it's hard for people, it's hard for Patricia, um, but try to see if you can incorporate some of that into your lifestyle. Try to do the best you can with a heart healthy diet. Take the right medicines that the doctor is recommending. You may not necessarily need a stress test. If you're feeling great, you don't necessarily need it um, as long as you're, you're taking the right medicines. But, but I, it, it does raise a little bit of concern in my mind, given her history. Okay, we have another phone call from uh, Mary. Good evening. Hello. Hi, Mary. Yes, I have a question um, about a test. Um, I was feeling periodically lightheaded, a um, little bit dizzy, and uh, I was sent for a CAT scan of my heart and uh, got the report that I had a score of 41 and was recommended to see a cardiologist because of my uh, rather extreme family history. And what does 41 mean? Dr. Forrester. <laughs> Well, this one I'm going to have to defer to my cardiologist. Okay. So, so I guess that too. I guess yeah. Sean's oh, okay. the expert here. I, in Chicago, we brought this new technology into the Heart Institute, and I was the nurse they hired to go over the preliminary results, and so educating physicians about the technology. A 41 score is a very small amount in the early stages of the disease. Your cholesterol numbers need to be under control. Your blood pressure, your risk factors need to be treated aggr aggressively doesn't necessarily mean that you have a blockage in there, but you're building up disease. It's in the smaller, earlier stages, and you don't want it to get it any worse. So you want to really see that doctor and get those risk factors under control. How does the scale work? Well, about half of people are going to have a zero score, interestingly enough. And the accuracy rate of that is a 99%. We call it negative predictive value, that that means they don't have very much disease. And to those patients, I say, you just dodged a bullet. You need to really behave yourself, or that won't stay that way as you get older. When they get up to about 10 to 100, we're getting their cholesterol numbers aggressively under control, but it's still a small amount in the earlier stages. As it gets up closer to 400 and higher, and they can go very much higher, they're running additional stress tests just to see if this amount of disease that 
the test is indicating is the sludge that's building up in the arteries isn't causing a blockage somewhere. So it's not a perfect test. And the accuracy rate of that positive score is 98, 99, 100%. It's a very mm -hmm. accurate test, which I'm very much in favor of people getting screened and seeing what they're doing. But it just tells you, do you have a small amount of disease, a small, a large amount? And then that gives the doctor more information on how aggressive to treat you. Okay. Good question. Can, okay. I, can I add two things? Absolutely. Uh, so two things. Just, so what the, the calcium again is, so you have plaque buildup in your, in your blood vessels. Over time, the plaque becomes calcified. So that's simply, that's what we're looking for. And it just gives a score about how much of that is. So okay. it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a degree of how much plaque buildup you have. It's a starting point then for you as a doctor yeah, and, and for the patient. Yeah. And the, the second thing though, to be aware of though, is if you're a 40 year old woman, your score should be zero. If your score is 41, that's actually very high. If you're a 70 year old man, well, 41 might actually be low for you because right. a regular 70 year old man would actually have a, a, a mild to moderate amount of plaque buildup. So it does depend on how old you are and, and what your sex is in terms of wh what is the meaning of the score exactly. Okay. Good. Chris from uh, Spokane Valley. Hi, Chris. Hi. I have a question about the plaque. You're talking about plaque being calcified in the arteries, and I was just wondering, women are always being told that they need to take at least 1,200 milligrams of calcium supplements with D3 uh, in order to uh, avoid osteoporosis. Now, does excess calcium in the bloodstream become more plaque? Uh, I mean, can that be deposited as plaque? Uh, that's my question. Okay, thank you, Chris. How does, uh, we are encouraged to take our calcium. Does it build up in the that, that's okay. bloodstream? No, you can do that. Yeah. You can take your vitamin D and your calcium. That's not, uh, that does not increase your risk of calcification of plaque. I think people get really confused it about confusing. this process. And what happens <clears throat> is, when I explain it really simply, is when you have a blood pressure that's too high, it causes a sandpaper effect that artery on the inside lining. If your sugar's too high because you're overweight, that sugar bounces off the wall. And this is how I talk to patients because then they can visualize what's going on. It scratches that inside lining. If you smoke, it causes all kinds of trauma to that inside lining. Then imagine cholesterol traveling through the blood. It's literally going to get hung up there more easily. The body says, oh my gosh, something is where it doesn't belong and it starts this, it sends white blood cells to the area. Inflammation is what this is called. And when it's gone on long enough, like a cancer that's been in your body for too long, a tuberculous bacillus that's in your lung from TB, if it's been in there a long time, calcium is just what forms as part of that inflammation. So hardening of the arteries is the lay term for these calcium deposits. It's just part of this plaque, and it's just a marker or an estimate of how much disease is building up. Does okay. that help? So she should not be concerned at all about her no. calcium supplements then? No. Okay. No. We have Jackie from Spokane. Good evening, Jackie. Hi, um, I have a question. I am 66 years old. Um, I don't have my family history because I was adopted. Um, I do have several risk factors. Um, I have been treated for high blood pressure since I was a teenager. Um, I am on Crestor for my lipids, which um, the cholesterol is under control, but the triglycerides are not. Um, I also am a stress eater, and so I have some weight problems. I'm probably about 50 pounds overweight. And um, I don't get a lot of exercise except walking my dogs. I have um, spinal stenosis and some herniated discs, so it's not real comfortable for me to be out exercising, but um, my dogs keep me moving. Um, and I was wondering, uh, oh, and a few years ago I was diagnosed with uh, two heart murmurs. One was with a tricuspid valve, and I'm, I'm not real sure if the other one was mitral or not. Anyway, I, my question is, um, I haven't had really any uh, evaluation for a long time, and I wondered what your advice would be. So I uh, will we'll hang up and listen to your, to your answer. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jackie. Who would like to tackle Jackie's case? Well, uh, I'll tackle this, and then, and then I'll ask 
Sean or Matt to help me with this. This is, we see people like this in my office quite common. They, they can't do a whole lot, and they say, "Well, I have back pain. I have spinal stenosis. I have you know lumbar backage." That's a really tough problem for people because they can't get out. But I, I would encourage people to do what they can. Find something that you can do to address that. Now, regarding all of her risk factors and the fact that she hasn't had much of a workup, she's been seeing doctors, obviously, at some point who have told her these things, put her on these medications. That's a great start. If she's not having any symptoms, that's okay. But, but I would encourage someone like her to go see her primary care physician or if she has one, a cardiologist who can help her and coach her through those whether or not she needs a stress test or they need to look into those murmurs with an echocardiogram. People can have murmurs and they can have cholesterol issues and they can have even coronary disease. It doesn't mean you need a stent or an operation or a valve operation, but it does need to be followed by someone who's qualified. And that could be your primary care physician, it could be your cardiologist. Unfortunately, you don't want to see a surgeon unless you really need one. And, and, and a lot of people can avoid us. And, but I think the first thing is, is what this lady is doing is, is identifying that she's got some risk factors and asking her doctors to take a look. Do I need these tests? Mm -hmm. She sounded a little overwhelmed by her conditions. She sounds like a lot of people. It's, mm -hmm. it's overwhelming to, to, to have to deal with some health problems and everything goes along with it. So it's, it's difficult. I mean, ultimately, um, uh, that's understandable, and, and we, we see that a lot. And it's, uh, um, I mean, there's ways to kind of take, take control of these things uh, and try to, again, try to be the healthiest person that you can be, uh, which what I would encourage her to do, and, and certainly... Um, uh, and certainly be in close communication with the people who are treating her as well to make sure that she understands what she needs to do in, in, in terms of you know preventing heart issues in the future, heart attack or stroke. I, and the only th just to piggyback on in terms of what Dr. Forster was saying here, you know I think there's a little bit of a uh, the the layperson has a kind of a misunderstanding of in terms of when we do heart stents or bypass surgery, you know what is how does that benefit me and. And just to kind of understand that largely that is that is the that is for our symptomatic folks, and again, although you know Tom was didn't have symptoms, but he did, you know, he is one of those people who did have severe heart disease, who I think did benefit from bypass surgery. Largely, that those types of treatments are for people who have symptoms, and and for the most part, if we're talking about just treating heart attacks or preventing heart attacks or strokes, it is goes back to the basics, the lifestyle things we've talked about, appropriate medications, and as long as you're doing that, and she's being followed and treated and having her blood pressure treated and her cholesterol treated and doing the best she can uh, in terms of other preventative things, she will give herself the best chance to prevent a heart attack and stroke. And ultimately, and most of the things will say, you don't need to have a stress test per se um, if you're doing the best you can. And ultimately, stress test is more for the folks who have symptoms in general. Mm -hmm. So, You probably hear this type of story quite a bit. What would you suggest, Jenny, that where she, a starting point for her, she needs a starting point to get active, something she can do perhaps sitting or just to kind of get the, the ball rolling? Well, the first thing I'd want to find out is if she's suffering from depression, negative mood states like boredom and fatigue, that can really sabotage the best of people's efforts to try to live a healthier life. Secondly, is she skipping meals? People who struggle with weight often skip meals, the blood sugar drops, Crave, the brain kicks in and says, feed me, feed me, feed me. And it's a vicious cycle that goes up and down all day long. Social support's really important. Water aerobics for people who can't do exercise. Mm -hmm. You know, tops, take off pounds sensibly. Weight Watchers, those programs have a lot of good eating and exercise uh, approaches. But I think the social support's even better. So small baby steps, eat regular meals, try to add a little protein with each meal. And you know, really look, are you suffering from depression? I think so many obese people are suffering from that and we're not recognizing it. The American Heart Association is asking us as healthcare providers to ask with every visit to check that out with our patients because it's hard to have behavior change in the face of that. Mm -hmm. I'd add on to that, you probably know the statistic, I think it was the nurse health study from Harvard. If you go from no activity to one hour a week, now I, I, even I could do an hour a week. I mean, that's doable for most people. It, the risk of heart disease in general was down by about almost 50% compared to those who don't do anything. Now that was over time. I mean, you're not gonna fix that in a week, but boy, just going, if you can take one step in the right direction, you can really impact, you know, a little bit of exercise helps all those things. I mean, exercise is the best thing we've got. It's not as 
fun as the surgeries or as cool as pills or as easy, but it's probably about the best thing we've got going. And even a little bit per week, an hour a week is, I even, I, I give that statistic out a lot because a lot of folks feel I'm too, I'm, so I, you might as well stop now. I, 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 I can't even go forward and I say, hey, don't give up yet, you know. Mm -hmm. So okay. an hour a week is doable. It's interesting. Um, that's what I was studying when I went back to school. And in the most recent obesity guidelines, which were released in November of 2013, the prescription for obese patients, which we know 70% of Americans are either overweight or obese, was women cut your calories 12 to 1500 a day and less, men less than 1800 calories a day, and everybody get up and exercise aerobically on average about 30 minutes a day. Now the research has shown over and over again that absolutely works and you'll lose weight. But why aren't people doing it? Because it's too hard. Yeah. And so when you get this lady who's 50 pounds overweight, and I'm teaching a weight class right now, and uh, it needs to be simpler. It may be for her going for a five minute walk out that front door, adding an apple to her diet. If we give them that prescription, and we do it, books that are written on this topic have the same prescription. They're going to get overwhelmed, they're going to stick their head in their sand, and they're going to do more harmful behaviors because we've induced this negative mood that's upsetting them. And the, the new research is showing us small, small changes that fit easily into their everyday life so they're not overwhelmed by it. You're absolutely right. There is nothing that exercise, if they could come up with a pill for exercise, <laughs> somebody make billions of dollars. Thin and beautiful. But I, <laughs> on that note, sorry, for no, my kids want to plug for a dog, but Walk having a dog, dog yeah. Right. I mean, Absolutely. two thirds of people, if you have a dog, you're like 60% more likely to get the number of steps per day. I mean, that's a, that is a healthy thing. So, sorry, and honey. You guys all, well, you guys all look like athletes to me, and I'm surrounded by athletes. I hate exercise. So the audience out there, they're gonna love me saying this, the only thing I found that I can do to get it into my everyday life is to make it fun. So I downloaded Pandora.com on, on my phone and I put on the craziest music and I get lost in the music and I can walk. So I'm not an athlete, but I can do that. And so we have to just give them simple strategies to make it fun. Dancing, walking a dog, whether you have one or not, all of those things help. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We have Lynn from Diamond Lake uh, with a question tonight. Hi, Lynn. Hi, thank you. Um, I have a lipedema, a vascular disease, um, and I swell a lot, and I'm having some symptoms, and I'm wondering whether to be concerned about it. Um, there's like a pressure, well, it's not pressure, it's more like a bubble inside my chest. Um, my legs are swollen more than usual. My feet are uh, turning dark. Um, and I do exercise three times a week. I go to water aerobics for about an hour and a half each time. Um, that helps get some of the fluid out, but the fluid's just not moving very well anymore. And I wondered, uh, are these heart symptoms or something else? I mean, you know, my neck is kind of swelling, um, that sort of thing. Hmm. All right, thank you, Lynn. It's that would be fair to get checked out. I'd say by I'd start with your primary care provider, and um, though that's a tough condition, and I'm not I'm no expert in lymphedema, but it can often overlap with other symptoms of uh, heart disease, uh, swollen legs, and breathlessness. I mean, a bubble in your chest. All of us have seen things. I've given speeches to people telling them, "Oh, I'm not concerned about your symptoms," and you get the labs back or an EKG, and you go back in with a different, I mean, we're, we have to have a high suspicion, of course, going in, but those symptoms, I would, if somebody, a loved family member called me and said that, I'd say, hey, if I were you, I'd call your primary provider and get in to be seen, get your blood pressure checked, and a physical exam, and they, you know, the eyeball test is worth a lot, so I think it'd be fair to get checked out for that. I don't think that's overly conservative. Okay, we're also receiving a few emails this evening. We have Dan who writes, what do you learn from a cardiac MRI? Dan Davis would like to know an answer to that. You can learn a myriad everything. of things. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, uh, you can learn uh, everything. It, it depends on what the question is, but it can be a very useful tool uh, to diagnose many things uh, in, in terms of the spectrum of heart, heart disease. So um, that's, a t that's a tough question because you can learn just about everything. Mm. Who, who you, do, do you recommend have one? Well, I, we don't necessarily recommend anybody in particular have one just in, in general, but it, it can address all of those three or four big broad topics I mentioned we've been talking about 
primarily coronary artery mm -hmm. disease, but an MRI can be looking at, at the structure of the heart, the valves, it can be looking at the aorta, it can be looking at the muscle itself, it can be looking at the muscle in relation to coronary artery disease. There's a number of things that really can look at a lot. It's, it's so many that it's really difficult to, to recommend who should have one. So that'd be a decision that primarily your cardiologist or in some cases your cardiac surgeon who's preparing for an operation or something would recommend. It's typically not a screening test unless you're looking for something that's very specific that one of your doctors would be looking for. Okay. Jen from Edmonton. Good evening, Jen. Hi, um, thanks for taking my call. Um, I'm actually calling on behalf of my mother who has been diagnosed with PVC, which I believe means like extra heartbeats. And um, she actually had um, some of her thyroid removed um, in 2007. And she's, she's on a beta blocker right now, but she is worried that the doctors might not be thinking of it as a, like the extra heartbeats or the palpitations as a thyroid problem, perhaps, as opposed to a cardiac problem. Okay. So she wants to know what her next step should be, her next move should be? I don't think we Sorry, heard Jen. So. Oh, yeah. thank you, Jen. Thank you. PVCs, this is like being on Jeopardy and finding out the categories my hometown landmarks or something. <laughs> but that is an electrical problem. Yeah. And it can, it can, the thyroid can affect that. You can have an increase in PVCs with thyroid disease, a hyperactive thyroid in, in, uh, in particular. Uh, but it does stand for premature ventricular contraction. And the heart has the ability to beat and have electricity spontaneously from uh, the group of cells at the top of the heart that's your natural pacemaker. A PVC is an extra beat that comes from below in the, vent in the ventricles. There are four chambers in the heart, the top two and the bottom two, and the bottom are the ventricles, if I got that right, Matt. So the premature beats from below can be uh, harmless. They're very common. I've never had a heart monitor without at least one PVC or PAC. Mm. But if you have too many of them, they can be uh, a symptom of coronary disease. And so her next step should be, um, you know, it, I see PVCs all the time. And what I do before I see these people, we have an idea with a 24-hour recording as to how many PVCs they're having. And it also tells us if they're coming from one spot within the heart or more than one spot. That's a big uh, difference there. If you're having PVCs from more than one spot, that's, that's a smoke and gun. Your, your first thing you need to do is rule out coronary disease with that. Ischemic coronary disease is a, is a very common cause for uh, PVCs of more than one morphology. If they're coming from one spot, um, often they're harmless and people don't even feel them. And you can watch them safely. Uh, if you are symptomatic with them, we, we love to see them and we're glad to help people with medicines. In extreme cases, if medicines don't help them, if you're very symptomatic, and in extreme cases, you'll have so many PVCs that it actually can weaken the heart muscle. It's, a, and it's an electrical phenomenon where instead of using the normal conduction system of the heart, it's the electricity is traveling against the grain. You can go in and find that PVC uh, literally, physically, with the tip of an electrical catheter. We can go through the leg. You'll kind of hunt that thing down, and you'll, uh, if it's in a place that's safe to ablate, you can turn on energy and burn the spot and help people um, with symptoms and with uh, heart, with a cardiomyopathy, with a weakened heart from that. So the first step, though, is the recording. You want a 24-hour period, give or take, where you can quantify the number and the location they're coming from. It can be a bunch of things, but that's the first step would be to go down that road. Okay. We have an email from Jim, and I think Jim's asking a question a lot of people ask, and one you probably often get, should I take aspirin daily to prevent heart attacks? And this, is, uh, this one's gone back and forth in the last few years. Uh, this, this is true. I think there's been a little bit of discussion recently about you know, who should take aspirin. I think uh, previously, I think it was more broad, you know, anybody, I don't know, over the age of 40 was maybe taking aspirin. Uh, but aspirin is not benign. I mean, there's a, there's a risk with taking a daily aspirin. You can develop bleeding stomach ulcers or potential other complications. So you have to weigh those risks. Um, I, I think that um, for me, I, I typically will reserve that for men if we're talking about prevention of heart attack and stroke. Women, it's not as beneficial. Uh, mm -hmm. If anything, uh, some benefit in reducing stroke. Uh, and that's probably in women or, who are older, maybe over the age of 60 or so, and especially if they have like high blood pressure. Um, in men, over the age of 50, and if you have some risk factors. Um, 
And you can, you know, as a, your doctor can calculate again what your risks are and they can plug it into a calculator versus sometimes they just, they kind of just generally do it that way. But that, that's probably the people who I would recommend an aspirin for is those types of age ranges with some risk factors. With again, I think much more, I think more so, I think it's an, unfortunately for women, I think the, the aspirin has been shown to be, if anything, helpful in men and is not as helpful in women except for maybe some prevention of stroke. Um, with the most recent literature. Mm -hmm. What dosage? Still a baby aspirin? Baby aspirin, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think we rarely use full dose aspirin, even if you have heart disease. Uh, uh, if you've had stents or a heart attack, we don't hardly ever use a full dose aspirin. So it's predominantly baby or two baby aspirins. Okay. We have a question from Donna this evening on the phone. Good evening, Donna. Hello. And you have a question for our panel? Uh, yes, please. Thank you for taking the phone call. And, um, I'm almost 49, and I have diabetes type 2, and I'm wondering what vitamins or food, and I know exercise, that would be also helpful for my heart, since I am, of course, is everything is sticking to me now. <laughs> so what would be a good vitamins and food, please, um, for my heart and my body at this age, please? Okay. Well, we haven't talked about supplements at all. Jenny, do you recommend any supplements? You know, that is not really my area of expertise. Mm. I'm more into, we know that fresh fruits and vegetables have a lot of wonderful chemicals in there naturally that mm. lower blood pressure and do amazing things, but I'll let one of the cardiologists take that one. Mm -hmm. Any supplements that uh, any of you recommend? Lipitor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, you know, it, it turns out a lot of the supplements, unfortunately, have not really bore out to be that helpful. Um, you know, I don't know that they're harmful per se. I would say a type 2 diabetic, you know, a, a plant-based diet. Uh, I would uh, be careful about the, the carbohydrates, especially, you know, simple sugars and those kind of things would be the main focus of your diet for that, for that type of person. Um, in general, that's good for non-diabetics as well. Uh, diets high in fish, you know, or and or fish oil, uh, that may that may be helpful, um, and that's also kind of a component of a, like a Mediterranean diet. So that would be some things you may want to to look at. And then and then typically diets high in fiber. I don't know if we think of that as a supplement, but either fiber from foods or fiber as a supplement is, is usually very helpful as well. Mm -hmm. In so your I, book, Jenny, you actually. Um go over some of the more popular diets and you mentioned mm -hmm. Weight Watchers earlier. Um, is that a, are some of those good plans for people to start? Because some people do need a plan. They need something to look mm -hmm. at and follow. Do you that, recommend some of those? That's a great question. The U.S. News World and Report every year evaluates maybe 20 or 30 of the top diets like the Paleo diet, the gluten-free diet, the Weight Watchers, the DASH diet which is a dietary approach to stopping hypertension came out number one. Mediterranean diet. So they look at all of them and they rank them. And some of these people on this panel, I'm aware of, I know, they endorse my book. Um, they're, they're really solid, good people. So that's a great reference place for people to go just Google that their, two, their 20, you know, 16 report. Um, when I looked at it as a graduate student in my, my career, I like the DASH diet, I like the Mediterranean diet. I cut it down to a really simple eat more fruits and vegetables whenever you can unless you're a diabetic and then you have to be careful with the fruits because it's so the, the fruit sugars mm -hmm. can be harmful eat whole grain breads beans dark rice lean meat the size of a deck of cards no more than twice a day low fat dairy products because you need the calcium avoid processed foods as much as you can reduce your salt reduce your portions and that's a diet that just about anybody can follow and the takeaway point is just add fruits and vegetables wherever you you can. Um, diabetics are a special case. They need to talk to their diabetic nurse educator. Or educator. Okay. We have Don with a question from Tenasket. Hi, Don. Hello. Um, my question, I'm 57, um, in fairly good shape. I do a lot of outdoor activity. I um, raise all my own food, so I do very, very little processed food. And I recently suffered an AFib and was cardioversion back into rhythm. Um, um, I have been a moderate drinker in the past, and I have never smoked cigarettes, but I do smoke marijuana. And um, but as you said earlier, this has been a wake-up call, and um, I am cut back on every uh, no whiskey or beer, anything like that. But I do hope that one or two hits in the evening of marijuana 
is not going to be detrimental and possibly a glass of wine. What do you say to that? All right. Thank you, Don. Thanks for your question. Hey, Fib, and I'm up to date on that. There's not a lot of research with marijuana, which is there will be someday it's as it becomes more and more um, used and legalized and what have you. Uh, AFib, <clears throat> the best thing to do for AFib to reduce your risk of recurrence is uh, be a, a good body weight, get checked for sleep apnea, exercise, hypertension, um, diabetics, smoking is a risk factor for recurrence. I would guess, although it's not been studied in marijuana, I'm, I, would, I would bet that that does increase the risk of recurrence. It needs to be weighed against the benefits, whatever they might be, right? Um, and excessive alcohol use, you did hit on that one. So probably the, the single biggest risk factor that can be reduced, uh, age is a big one, which we can't go back on, of course, and then your g genetic code. The, bi the biggest risk factor we're finding out now is exercise and lifestyle as well as sleep apnea. So if you snore at night, if you're overweight, I recommend all my patients get a sleep study. And that can, uh, that's been shown to reduce the risk of recurrence of AFib. Um, and there are some certain blood pressure medicines that can also reduce the recurrence, the rate of recurrence. Some of the simple generic ones like lisinopril, ACE inhibitors. There's new data showing ACE inhibitors and the angiotensin or uh, AR ARBs, um, the, the certain class of blood pressure medicines, they, they've been shown to to impact the rate of recurrence. So you could bring that up with your uh, provider and say, hey, you know, my, the doctor said I could think about doing an ACE inhibitor if you're on something like that for blood pressure, but that's been shown to be of benefit. Mm -hmm. He mentioned a glass of wine in the evening. A glass of wine is okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Red wine still better than the white or? Red, I, I'm not sure about the two compared to each other, but yeah. Depends if you're having, I guess, poultry or red meat. Right? I'm a Chardonnay girl, yeah. so I'm drinking the white. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. Do you guys I, recommend I, one or the other? I think they're similar in terms I of the, to, to the yeah. benefits. So yeah. if you're a white wine drinker, feel free. Okay. Okay. We have another phone call. We're going to try to squeeze in a few more before the end of the show. Fran in Calgary. Good evening, Fran. Hi. Thanks for taking my call. I have two quick questions. One is um, I'm now 70. Um, I'm not terribly overweight. Um, I eat fish, either canned salmon or canned sardine every day, like throughout the week. Um, and uh, I read somewhere where that could be a problem. And the other question is, um, I had my apolipoprotein B checked and it's high. My LDL is high. Where do I go from here? Okay, thank you, Fran. Uh, <laughs> Bouncing it off you. So this subspecialty so, cholesterol, do you guys see yeah. much of that? It's not. It's been studied, and it's not. Right, right. LDL is so, still the best marker. Yeah, so I mean, your LDL is high. The uh, there's other there's other uh, kind of cholesterol particles that can be measured. Uh, LDL is your bad cholesterol, and so the fact that that's high, I think, tells most of the story. The other factor being high kind of supports the fact that the the cholesterol is abnormal and needs to be addressed. And so depending on you know, what the levels are and if you have other risk factors, um, again, something to talk to the doctor about. Again, uh, dietary interventions if you're not already doing them. And then certainly there'd be some consideration of medication to, to treat that and lower the LDL if, if it is high. And sardines, I think, have high cholesterol, I believe. And, you know, so there could be a connection yeah. with so the fact So I think that would be the concern those. with that. And there, there, are some, so there are some types of fish that are a little bit more fatty and whatnot. And so... Um, and so while they can be heart healthy, they can have some, some of those side effects as well. Okay. I wanted to address that, the new emerging research. Mm -hmm. There is about to come on the scene a, a bunch of new, based on the genetic code being identified a few years ago, genetic markers. For instance, we know that the size of that LDL cholesterol, that's the bad cholesterol, if it's too small, it's going to wiggle into that wall where all that plaque and that debris is mm -hmm. building up. Some LDL that you're born with is just more aggressive. It just, we call it more atherogenic. It just wants to wiggle into that wall more easily than, the, than other cholesterol. We know, we're beginning to understand that some HDL healthy cholesterol doesn't work as well as other. We call that emerging research. And that means that if you measure it in San Francisco is a 10 on that blood test, whatever you throw out a number, is it the same in New York City? Because not all labs are standardized on some of these new mm. tests. The American Heart Association, the American College of Cardiology, physicians like you guys and nurses, 
we're waiting to see the research before we can get behind these new tests and say we ought to be doing it. But that is an exciting area that's going to be exploding, I believe, in the next few years because there's a lot of really neat things happening mm -hmm. there. We still are hearing know your numbers, which the cholesterol number is included in that. What are the other numbers we need to know and be aware of, Dr. Forrester? Um, I don't know so much about numbers necessarily. I mean, cholesterol is good to know. It's good to know your blood mm -hmm. pressure. Um, any other numbers you can think of? I, I think in general it's, it's better to live a, a healthy lifestyle and I, I tend to tell my patients that you can get really confused with a, a lot of details and, and how to be heart healthy. And in my mind it comes down uh, to common sense and I try to tell people to simplify it. You know how to be healthy, you know how to eat healthy and if you don't there's a lot of people that can help you and there's so many diets you can get overwhelmed with which is better. Um, I, I think a diet is important for somebody who needs some structure in their life and that's really what that does. Somebody who knows that you know I, uh, everything in moderation, moderation and that and someone a lot more famous that I is, has said that a long time ago but I think if you know your blood pressure and you know your cholesterol and, and you've got a primary care physician who you can talk these things through uh, with, it, that's what you need to do and, and I wouldn't worry too much about which study is better than the other but yeah, this is really Dr. Spangler's expertise in his field, if he can add anything to that. Yeah, I think, I think adults should, should, should know their blood pressure. Mm -hmm. That should be checked. I think their cholesterol should be checked periodically. Uh, they should have a fasting blood sugar to screen yeah. for diabetes. Um, you probably should know your weight or your waist circumference. You may not want to tell people, but you should know what they are. Uh, <laughs> and keep it locked up. <laughs> keep it, but, but know it. Um, and so I think those are probably the main things to know about in terms of Again, things that will put you at risk for problems in the future. So you should, you should be aware of those and, and don't ignore those and uh, be naive of those. Okay. Well, we have run short on time this evening. It was a very good discussion. I appreciate all of your uh, expertise this evening and, and our discussion and all the phone calls that we took and emails as well tonight. We also want to let you know about an event that is coming up in March, and that is the Go Red for, or Go Red for Women Luncheon. It is sponsored by the American Heart Association. It's on March 9th at the Spokane Convention Center. It's $125 per person for a ticket, and our own uh, Jenny Johnson from the panel tonight will be the keynote speaker at that event. So if you are interested in attending, we have posted a link at our website. Just go to ksps.org and click where it says Health Matters. And then be sure to join us on March 24th when our topic will be the rise of type 2 diabetes. And again, I want to thank everyone for being here tonight and your phone calls and your questions. And that will do it for this edition of Health Matters. We'll see you again in March. Thanks so much. I'm Teresa Lukens. Health Matters is made possible by our viewers, the friends of KSBS, and by Providence Healthcare. Providence's motto is know me, care for me, ease my way. And Providence does that. I've seen it over and over again. I'm Dr. Stephen Murray and I chose Providence because I believe in their mission statement. And working together with others of like mind is a very powerful way to take care of patients. My name is Beth Perez and I am a registered nurse and I work at Holy Family Hospital on the labor and delivery unit. I'm about to have my second child and I chose Providence because I love and trust the people that I work with and why wouldn't I seek care from people that I love and trust.